Welcome everyone. How are we doing today? All right. Have we all adjusted to fall back? Mostly. Any of us want to fall back another week? Mm-hmm. Extra hour of sleep for everyone? Wouldn't that be nice? Well, in the next 30 minutes, if you need that nap time, you feel free to go right ahead. And as soon as you fall asleep, your neighbor is going to elbow you a really good one. So just, you know, forewarning that that might happen. Sound good? Okay. Glad that you're here, whether you're here live in person or online. It's an absolutely brilliant day for you to be here because we're wrapping up a series that we've called Corrupted. Taking a deeper look at what does it mean to nourish the soul that we've been given. Did you know, out of all of creation, we are the only living beings that have a soul? That's really cool. And because of that, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to care well for our soul. We've been using this verse, Micah 6.8, as our foundation for these conversations. We've been talking about different elements of these verses, of this verse in particular. So what I want you to do is I want you to, one last time, read it out loud together along with me. And if you're looking for a verse to memorize, might I suggest that this could be an excellent one for you to put into practice, into your heart, and into your mind. Let's read this together. The Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Four-part series that we've dived into, we talked about what is good. We want to focus on what is good, because when we're focusing on what is good, that's what we allow to filter into our souls, into our hearts, into our minds, and that's what's going to spill out from us cascading or vomiting onto the lives of other people is whatever's inside of us. That's why health is so important. Then we talked about making it right or biblical justice and and being a people, being an individual that's going to restore relationship even when it's agonizingly frustrating to try and do so. We talked about some strategies and how we can accomplish that. Then we talked about mercy. One part compassion, one part availability, and today we're going to talk about humility. As I was thinking about the word humility, I was reminded of this story that I was once told of a young mom and her little boy, and they were having a face-to-face conversation, and so they were right down in each other's vision, and this little boy noticed some marks on his mother's face and pointed them out and said, Mom, what are those? And mom was talking to this little boy and saying, well, those are called freckles. And freckles are like beauty marks from God. And all this great, amazing explanation of what freckles are. And she could see this little boy was just processing everything that his mother had just told him. And he replied instantaneously almost like, they're disgusting. But the rest of your face is kind of nice. Isn't that the case sometimes with this whole idea of humility? It's kind of like this big overall reality check. Sometimes we're not aware of the moments where we need to be humbled. Sometimes we're aware of the moments where we need to walk in humility. And other times there are well-meaning individuals that come along and try to bring humility into our lives. And so we're going to look at what humility actually is from a biblical perspective. If you've got a Bible with you, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Matthew, the 23rd chapter. We're going to read the first 12 verses. We'll get right into it, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what does it mean to walk humbly with God on a daily basis to the best of our ability. If you don't have a Bible, and you are here today, live in person, and you want one, come see me after the service. As Sea Road Community, we're going to gift you with one. We believe it is the best thing that you could ever do to begin reading it and investing it into your life. And so we want to gift that to you. Also, if you've got a mobile device and you want to get all techie with your Bible, take it wherever you go. You can download the, my favorite Bible app, which is Version, Y-O-U, then the word version. It's the Bible app there. And you can actually partner with us live in our sermon notes that go live every Sunday. You click on the more section, you click on the event sections, and it'll pop up right there at the top of the events, C Road Live. Matthew chapter 23, the first 12 verses. Let's get it. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey what they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. 
They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra-wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with extra-long tassels, and they love to sit at the head table at banquets and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi. Don't let anyone call you rabbi, for you have only one teacher, and all of you are equal as brothers and sisters. And don't address anyone here on earth as father, for only God in heaven is your spiritual father. And don't let anyone call you teacher, for you have only one teacher, the Messiah. The greatest among you must be a servant. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. What does it mean to walk humbly with God. That's a potent set of phrases, set of verses, a diatribe, so to speak, that Jesus talks about when, what the picture of humility is, looking at what the, the human interpretation of humility sometimes is versus God's interpretation of humility. Here's what we need to know about this particular discourse that Jesus is engaged in here in this moment. This is towards the end of his ministry life and the end of his physical life here on earth. He's coming to the close, the crescendo moment, the apex moment of his purpose here on earth. And so he is swinging for the fences, going for the home run, making sure that there is no confusion about what is to come and what needs to be practiced by those who are going to follow after him. Now, interestingly enough, if you and I were stitching together a story and we were stitching together a story of, of this hero person coming to a, an environment, a culture, a people group, we would want that hero to be surrounded with allies. And if you think about the life of Jesus for a moment, all that he came to do and say and be here in our world, he needed some people, some allies to join him in that mission. And if you and I were just guessing we would think that those people that were already religious could have been those individuals. Those people who knew or understood a little bit of the background, the purpose, the meaning behind everything that God did up until that point, they would be the people that he would use to change the world around, the rest of the world. In fact, though, the challenge is these people, instead of becoming allies, they were adversaries to what God wanted to do. See, what happens from time to time is in our best intentions, when we step out and try to do things to the best of our ability, our ability in our own thinking, in our own mindset, in our own strength, we can unintentionally become an adversary to what God wants to do. These men and these women gathered together, these religious leaders, elitist mentality, were trying to preserve everything they knew from a historical, traditional perspective. And in doing so, they actually missed what Jesus was doing in the moment. Let that sink in for just a minute. Are there times where you and I operate similarly in our own lives? Where we miss what Jesus wants to do because we're so used to or accustomed to him doing this other thing or this other traditional expression of what we are familiar with, what we're comfortable with. So like I said, if you and I were writing this story and this hero shows up into this environment, we'd be thinking he'd be surrounded by a group of allies and the people that we would think would be his allies because of their connections, their familiarity, their things they have in common ended up being his greatest adversaries. Towards the end of his life, he gives this great discourse, this challenge saying like, yeah, 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 listen to what they teach, but do not follow their example. Do you want that to be said about you? <laughs> I was thinking about that this week. I'm like, man, I do not ever want that to be said about me. Like when my kids grow up and they leave my house, I don't want them to think like, man, my dad was a decent parent, but I'm not going to parent anything like him. I mean, we've never thought about that, right? Like none of us. Sometimes that happens. We're imperfect. And that's why humility is such a great foundational piece to the conversation about what it means to follow God. 
Now, I want to take this one layer a little bit different because Jesus describes this, this picture of what these religious elite leaders kind of look like. And so I brought a picture with me. It's going to go up on screen here in just a moment and what this actually meant and looked like. And so he talks about them binding, binding these large prayer boxes to their arms and to their heads. This is kind of a modern day expression of what that looks like. You can see on the left arm, they've got this big long strap and this whole apparatus that is connected there. There's a big lump, which is this prayer box filled with God's scriptures, these verses. And this comes from the, the invitation from, from the book of Deuteronomy where God's speaking to his people. He's just rescued them from a life of slavery in Egypt. And he's like, I want you to write your truth on your bodies, your persons, to carry it with you, bind it to yourself. And so this is their literal interpretation of what that meant and what they would look like. And so this was an everyday wear for them. This was fashion 2.0 for the religious elite leaders of the day. They would wear this, they would walk through this, they would do so as an, as an outward symbol that they were a part of following God. That was their expression. So for contemporary expression of this, sometimes it's you and I uh, sporting a tattoo that is, you know, religiously oriented. Maybe it's a cross, maybe it's something like that. Maybe it's wearing a piece of jewelry like a cross, an earring or something that's a, an outward signal that we are pursuing God in some way, shape, or form. And in different cultures and different tribes, you're going to see different expressions of what this looked like. Interestingly enough, though, Sometimes this is all about being set apart and being seen in a different way. There's nothing to do with intimacy and more has to do with showing people who you are in some sort of overt way. So interestingly enough, when, when Jesus is talking about humility, he chastises the community and what they were a part of because it was anything but humility when they express themselves in this way. It was a signal that we are better than you because we are doing this in this way. Some of the things, if we're honest, that you and I do, that you and I don't do, are an expression of that very same thing. There's a difference between what true biblical humility is and what false humility is, or false piety. False humility, fa false piety is still at, hey, look at me because I know what I'm doing. Real, true, biblical humility is, don't look at me, look at the one who created me because he is the, the living, breathing, hope filler for everyone in all ways and in all things. And there's a slight difference in the expression of those two. I want to drill down on that a little bit more by talking about three different pieces of humility, three different ideas that we can kind of take and put into practice or stop doing and find relief from. The first is this, keeping up appearances just isn't worth the effort. Keeping up appearances just isn't worth the effort. In our culture today, right here in 2021, heading into 2022, the thing that we crave the most is authenticity. The thing we crave the most is authenticity. And maybe you're going like, there's no way. No, no, we, we want something that's real. We want real relationship. We don't want fake. We want real leadership. We don't want fake. We want real interactions with people. We definitely want real money. We don't want fake money. Anybody want fake money? I got a whole bunch of Monopoly money in my house. You're welcome to it. We want real. We want authentic we want to buy local because we know the people. We know the people, and so that has a sense of real authenticity around it. But if we're honest, you and I spend the majority of our time trying to keep up appearances. I can remember conversations in my household growing up, fights on the way to church in the car that we were having as a family. You get into that parking lot, and then you'd have this, this encouragement from mom or dad going like, okay, now that we're here, let's pretend like we didn't fight all the way here, right? Wipe the tears, blow the snotty nose, make it look like we've got it all together. And that wasn't done in a, in a negative or, or you know, harmful way or expression. 
That was just what we were doing. We didn't want people to know. We didn't want people to know. I can't help but think we still live like this today. We don't want people to know we're struggling. Because if they do, will they actually like us? We don't want people to know that we're having a hard time. We don't want people to know that we're excited. Because if we're excited and they're not excited, then I don't know how to connect with them anymore. Are they going to leave me? Are they going to be relationally disconnected because I'm excited and, and they're not excited? Are, are they going to be happy for me? Or are they going to be like, oh, you're one of those joy-filled people? Right? Let me just say this. Keeping up the appearances just isn't worth the effort. You will spend the majority of your time trying to make something look good. And in doing so, you're going to miss the point. Just like these religious leaders who would spend hours getting ready to go out into public, binding their arm, making sure that they got the right verses in the prayer box, making sure that their tassels were clean and they were nice and long. Can you imagine putting all that effort into your, your fashion, your, your outfit, and then you walk outside your door and you see your neighbor has done it even better than you? You're like, oh, come on, I got to have longer tassels now? Let's, like, come on. I didn't get the memo. We call it this here in our contemporary culture, keeping up with the Joneses. It's all about appearance. It's just not worth the effort. All of that effort that you and I channel into that could be redirected into things that Jesus cares about. He cares less about our appearance. You know what he cares about? Our heart and our integrity. And most often when you and I are trying to foster some sort of image, it's because we are filled with the opposite of humility. We're filled with pride. We're filled with a look at me mentality as opposed to look at what God is doing. Now I'm not advocating for stopping any sort of like self-care or bathing habits or anything like that. Wearing deodorant, brushing your teeth, all of those things are awesome. All of you middle school, junior high boys, brush your teeth, put on deodorant, brush your teeth, okay? And all of us should be a part of those things. That's not what I'm talking about. Yes, we have to take care of ourselves. Yes, it's okay to get a haircut, especially coming outside of COVID, right? We're done cutting our own hair. Go get some professional to do it for you. That's okay, but when all of our effort, all of our energy, all of our resources are tied up into our image, we miss a point. We miss the point. We miss Jesus who might be speaking to us right in that room, right in that moment. Because all we're concerned about is the way that people might see us or interpret us or talk about us when we're not in the room. Keeping up appearances, it's just not worth it. It's just, it's not worth it. Let's be real. Let's be authentic in who we are, knowing that who we are is who Jesus intended to create us to be. And we can celebrate in that because God never makes a mistake, ever. Second idea that we want to drill down on a little bit is this. Confidence is okay. Cockiness is not. Confidence is okay. Cockiness is not. Okay, wait a minute, Jason. We just talked a few minutes about not being focused on our image and all that stuff. Are you talking kind of around yourself in circles here? Not so much. Confidence is this, being okay with the way that you are wired. Confidence is this, being okay with the way that you are wired, the way that God has made you. Being okay with that. Every single one of you here today has a set of gifts and skills that are unique to you. Every single one of you. Even those of you online, you too, even though you're not here, you've got skills. You had to turn on your computer today. That's a skill, right? You've got skills. We all have these skills, these talents, and these abilities. It is okay to be comfortable in that skill, ability, and talent that you've been given. To be confident in it. As long as we're not defined by it. See, the skill that you and I have been given that's been placed in our hand 
should always point to the giver of that skill, that giver of the gift, not the skill itself. And this is where we, we miss it culturally a little bit. We get so enamored by a gift that somebody has that we don't think about their character. We don't think about who they are as a human being. I mean, how many NFL players need to be suspended for domestic violence before we understand that it's not about the gift? How many leaders that we've elected to leadership in some capacity, how many pastors need to have moral failures before we, don't, before we understand that it's not about the gift? It's okay to be confident Confidence is an expression of our security, of our identity. That's where confidence comes from. And when we place our confidence in our gift, gift mix, it becomes, it becomes just an expression of cockiness or arrogance. That's what it is. We miss the mark. If you think back to this story where Jesus is talking to the religious leaders, they're placing their confidence in their traditions and their routines in the historical expression of faith that they're a part of, and they missed the point. They missed the Messiah that they were waiting for. Like, at this point in time, it's been over like 400 years that they've been waiting for the Messiah to show up. And they missed him. He's standing right with them, and they still couldn't see him. Because their arrogance, their cockiness was in the way. And too often, that's an expression of you and me. We miss seeing Jesus because all we're thinking about is the gift that we have or the gift that we don't have. It's okay to be confident in the way that God's wired you. I enjoy preaching. I think I'm okay at it. I like it. Thank you. I was... Wasn't looking for an applause, but I appreciate that. I'm okay in it. I like it. But I fear the day when I get up and think, man, I can do this on my own. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Every week that I'm preparing, I'm begging the Lord to move. I'm begging the Lord to let me disappear so that he can appear I'm begging Jesus to do what it is that he can do. I can't change a mind. I can't change a heart, but God can. I like to picture myself as a talking donkey. It's biblical. Don't believe me? Go check it out. Google it. Talking donkeys. Balaam. You're welcome. Confidence is okay. Cockiness is not. It's okay to be confident in the gift that God has given you. Some of you are incredible in the way that you can love people. It is, it is amazing what you can do. Some of you are amazing in extending mercy. Some of you are amazing at lending a helping hand. And we know because all of us take advantage of you. Some of you are amazing at encouragement. And at the right time, you anonymously drop a note in the mail or write a letter, slide it into a friend's locker or slide into somebody's DMs with an expression of encouragement they need need in the moment. Some of you can pray like there's no tomorrow. And that's an amazing gift. Confidence is okay in the way that God has wired you. Cockiness is not. I hope and I pray that you and I would have one of those toddler moments, the freckle story, when we become too caught up in our own hype and somebody comes along and says, ooh, that's disgusting. But the rest of you is okay. The third expression that we're going to dive into is it's okay to, to not be okay but it's not okay to stay there. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. See, I happen to believe that as Jesus is giving this this kind of chastising conversation 
to these religious leaders, I think some of them would have been like, oh man, I'm not okay with this. Some of them might have even been convicted by what he was saying. But they didn't know what to do with it. And so they stayed the same. See, it's okay to not be okay. This world is broken, it's busted, it's imperfect. We're going to have highs, we're going to have lows, we're going to have everything in between. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be real with how we're experiencing life in the moment. It is not okay to stay in our brokenness. Here's what I mean by that. You and I can't engineer healing in any way, shape, or form. But Jesus can. See, when we experience a moment of brokenness, it's an invitation to be made whole, to be made new. What the religious leaders missed in this moment is they missed an invitation from Jesus. He was going to reset the table, so to speak, recalibrate things. And when it comes to soul care, this is what you and I need to be fully aware of. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. Because if we stay in our brokenness, if we stay in our sinfulness, if we stay rooted in all the things that are apart from God, that's all we will ever produce. That's all we will ever multiply. We multiply out of who God has created us to be. And the more that you and I embrace our identity, the more that you and I embrace the healing, the restorative nature of the presence of God, that's what gets reproduced out of our lives. A cascading thing. Something that we can't even engineer or control. It just happens because of what God is doing. That's why it's so important for us to embrace humility. It's like humility for me is completely a non-North American mindset. Because we're built and we're conditioned to think that we can do this on our own, in our own way, because we're entrepreneurial enough, or we are intellectual enough, or we are emotionally intelligent enough, or this, that, or the other. What I'm saying is it's, not, it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. If we want healing, if we want growth, if we want maturity, if we want restoration, we've got to go to the only place where those things will be completely satiated and satisfied. And that's in Christ alone. In Christ alone. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. What if you and I would take that invitation seriously? As a parent, as a friend, as a child, as a student, as an employee, as a stay-at-home domestic engineer, whatever your expression of role is in the moment, what if you and I took that seriously? What if you and I would learn that it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay there? What if you and I would learn that confidence and being confident in who we've been created to be is okay as long as we don't give in to pride or arrogance. What if you and I learned and expressed and pursued and resisted the idea of keeping up appearances, not wasting the time and the effort and the energy that we've been given, instead investing it in things that actually matter? these habits we put into place, we cultivate them on a moment, daily basis, weekly, monthly, annually. Our souls will be nourished. Our hearts and our minds will be healthy. And out of that health, Jesus is going to be able to produce some really cool fruit in us, around us, And maybe, maybe even through us. If we would just walk humbly with our God. 
I know it's a lot to take in and a lot to digest. And maybe you're like, man, this is my first week here. This is what I like. This is what I like all the time. Uh, kind of. When it talks about the health and well-being of our soul, we need to go to Jesus. He makes all things new. He covers his love, covers over a multitude of sins, a multitude of wrongdoings, even if that wrongdoing was five minutes ago, so that we can experience freedom. And in that freedom, we get to represent who he is by the way we live. It's my hope and dream that instead of being shared this thought, like listen to what they say, but don't follow what they do, it's my hope and dream that you and I would be known for something different. Listen to what they say because they know what they're doing and what they're doing is worthwhile. So in the next few moments, here's what we're gonna do. We've had a lot that we talked about over the last four parts of this series. If you've missed any of it, you can always catch up online via the podcast, YouTube, even our website. But here's what I know. I know that Jesus has been speaking to you in some way. And some of us have been more willing than others to listen to what God has having, is, is wanting to say and desiring to say to us in the moment. And we've responded along the way in step. Others of us have been waiting for a moment and a sign to move. Well, maybe that moment and that sign is right now. We're going to go into a time of prayer up here at the front, we've got three different prayer stations and spaces. And you're going to see a, a group of individuals that are going to start making their way forward right now. They're going to man these spaces. They're a combination of our pastoral staff team and our local board of administrators, which is a fancy title for board members, which is a fancy title for people that love you. And they're going to be up here, and we're going to be creating an opportunity and a time to pray for you. Now, those of you online are going like, wait a minute, am I going to have somebody show up at my house in the next few moments? No, but here's the cool thing. You can right now, in your chat of choice, Facebook Live or YouTube, write to us your prayer request. Now, if you're like, I don't want to make it public, you can send it to us in an email info at centennialroad.com or if you're like, I want more personal than that, jason at centennialroad.com we would love to pray with you not only today, but throughout this next couple of days week, months ahead, you name it. In these next few moments, it's an invitation for you and I to come to Jesus. Take whatever burdens, every whatever frustrations, whatever unanswered questions we might be living with and dealing with in the moment and bring them straight to the Lord. Asking him to move in ways that are impossible for us to do on our own. Some of us need to experience healing. Some of us came today not knowing what the future holds because we had a terrible conversation with a medical professional in recent history. Some of us need to be prayed with and prayed for so that we can go to Jesus and invite him to do what only he can do, and that's heal and restore and bring hope in hopeless situations. Some of you have been carrying around hurt for way too long. I've seen it. I've seen it. And there's a brokenness in you that has haunted you for years. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay there anymore. And maybe today you need to receive freedom from that by coming and bringing it to Jesus. There's nothing super spiritual about me or any of the other individuals up here. We're just people that love Jesus and love you. That's it. And what we want to do is we want to bring you right to Jesus. Some of you may not even know who Jesus is. I got to tell you, he's the best person you'll ever get to know. He's a companion and a comfort in all of the chaos. 
that exists in our lives. In every single moment, you can yell at him, you can praise him, you can celebrate with him, you can enjoy him. He's the best friend you'll ever have. He's the best friend you'll ever have. So over these next few moments, I want to just give you an invitation and permission to come to the Lord and to pray. And maybe you're like, man, I'm good. Me and Jesus, we're okay. That's, that's great. I love that you're in that space. That's amazing. You can partner with us in praying for those in your heart and in your mind that you know still need Jesus to work in their lives. And maybe it'll be somebody here today that you're like, oh my goodness, I need Jesus to work in their life. And you can do that in the next few moments. We can just pray alongside of one another, asking Jesus to move. Now, let me be really clear. This is not an age-specific thing. You don't have to be this high to ride the ride, okay? Jesus is for everyone. No matter what age or stage of life you're in, no matter what your mobility is or isn't, no matter if you're sitting in the balcony, sitting online on your couch in your pajamas, or sitting here in the bottom area, the spit zone, I like to call it, of this space. This is for everybody. We all need Jesus to move, to breathe, to restore. It's for all of us. So whether it's one of these spaces here at the front or for those of you who are really nervous about going to the front of any space, there's actually one at the back too. No excuses. Just an opportunity to meet and know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you can come talk to any one of us at these stations. We would love to introduce you to Jesus. If you need to be healed, if you need to be restored, if you need Jesus just to carry the burdens that you are carrying, come and pray. Let Jesus be who he is, set you free. Let's walk humbly with our God. Let me pray. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity that we have to live and breathe and move in you. Father, over these next few moments, as we just set aside time to, to pursue you individually and collectively, Lord, I just ask that you would give us the courage to follow where you lead, individually and corporately as a, a broader community. Father, we want to give you the space in these next few moments to grow, to heal, to restore to right-size everything that's in us, everything that's around us, everything that's inside of us. Father, we desperately need you. No more pretense, no more keeping up appearances, no more cockiness, which is just a veil for insecurity. Some of us, we're not okay and we need you. And that's okay. So as we come, as we come to you, Father, would you do what it is that you only you can do? Heal, restore, forgive, bring hope and life and perspective in the absence of those things. Over these next moments, Father, this is your show. Would you do what you need to do in us and through us so that those around us can get to know who you are by the hope, the life, the healing, the restoration they see in us. We want to be life-giving agents of hope by the way we live on a daily basis. Would you bless us, protect us, Father? Would you be gracious to us by turning your face towards us? Would you grant us your favor and your peace? And as we come, Father, would you meet us here? We pray this in your name. Amen.